That's perfectly fine. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the feast of trumpets. 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 Oh, she wants you to blow the trumpet. Yes, ma'am. Well, she's always no Somebody stole the mouthpiece. Oh, well, that won't work. Sorry. Somebody stole the mouthpiece? Well, somebody removed the mouthpiece. Okay. <laughs> so you wouldn't blow it anymore, probably. It wouldn't be. Where's the mouthpiece? Then? If it's tambourine, I'd have took it. Um, okay. Is there anyone needs to be added to the prayer list? Well, we have a praise for Clayton, Sherry's nephew. Okay. He, after his mother kicked him out and called the cops and the cops said they were going to put DPS on, I mean DHS after him and all that, he's found some family as close to Sherry that's letting him live there and they're good folks and he came by to see Sherry and everything's hunky-dory. So that's praise. Good. That's prayer. Yes, answer prayer. Any other prayers? <laughs> Debbie. Trumpet says I, I will be blown. I'm a little bit blown. <laughs> 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 the trumpet blew itself. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> May I request a prayer? Yes. Yeah. Um, I have a, a prisoner who's become quite close through the years. His name is Curtis. His case is being held um, to the Washington State Supreme Court on October 2nd, and we pray for God's will to be done on that. October 2nd, Curtis's case. Okay. So that will be Wednesday? Is that Wednesday? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, we'll pray. Anyone else? Well, I hope you're all praying for my wife. I've, I've already asked for prayer for her. Okay. Okay. Oh, Every day. Absolutely. In fact, do you have a prayer list? No. Mm. It's in my Bible, but I don't know where else. Bible, I think it's downstairs. I'm sorry. You should prepare me ahead of time. <laughs> All right. Uh, yes, sir. Bob Eaton, I don't know if he's on the prayer list or not. But yes, he is. He is. And we have uh, several new ones that we've put on there lately. Those, um, the Rankin family. Randy Rankin. Jester, do don't we need to put her on there, Miss Jester? Yeah. If you think of his name, we'll put him on the yeah. prayer list as well. Yeah. He was having what problems and all, and I told him I said, "Well, you need to start working on your spiritual life and everything else." Text back said everything was, it was real interesting stuff in there. Ah. Well, good. Is the prayer list in there? Well, we all need prayer because we all wind up in some real strange places sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> never know what God has in store. Right. Yes. All right, if you read that, and that'll get people off. All right. Kind of idea. Okay. Usually we start our prayer list out with Ephesians 1, 15 through 19. It says, Wherefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and 
revelation in the knowledge of Him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of His calling, and what the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of His power to us who believe according to the working of His mighty power. And let's see, first thing we have on the list is our leaders, which includes the heads of homes, political leaders, spiritual church leaders, Pastor Ramsey, doctors and lawyers and law enforcement and judges and sheriffs and the president. And then we have the Barleys, Kevin Stitt and Joseph Silk. Those are our local representatives. And Chris White, Richard Mack, the New Family, Judge Roy Moore Family, Charles Key, Bill Hopper, Dan Martinez, the Falk family, Nicole, the G.B. Oliver, Cheryl Gwaltney, Billy, Billy Dodson, Mayor John Tyler Hammond, Jimmy Westbrook, Bob Campbell, Charles Pearson, Wayne Drake and his family, Alex Jones, Doc, Scott Jones, Texan Wanda Mars, Creation Science Hoban, Robert Deming, David Barton, the Forsters, Mr. and Ms. Don Shaw, Lindsey Williams, Joe Watkins, Joe Arapayo, David Wilson, Snowden, George Touchstone, Amanda T. Garden, Admiral Lee, Dennis Payman, Ben Koppelman, Chris Olson, Dean Gotcher, the Hammonds, the Bundys, the Hages, Walter Bythe, Trey Gowdy, and then we have the sick and the afflicted, and we're praying for good and better health for Pam Spolita, Mark, Cheryl's co-worker Karen, Mac Nichols, the Mac Nicholases, JT and Betty Hale, the Skipper family, Katie Hamilton's family, the Fair family, Mike Lewis, the Pitchfords, Rose, Linda, the Talents, that's uh, Linda and Larry and their family, Harry and Judy and Piper and Gracie and Carolyn Davis family, Reuben, Lou Baker, the Blake family, the Todd and the Webb family, Pat and Linda's eye and Jana and Jana and their families and Don Ellis and Linda and Aline and Diana and John Reed and Clifford and Jerry Parsons and Mac and Tommy Wakeland and Jaquita and Randy and Mr. and Ms. Shear and Paula and Bob Privet and I think that's Ardell, Arcel, James Wood, Larry Couch, Linda Camp, Noah, Jeff Seacrest, I think that's what that says, Mary Elizabeth. Jim and Sharon Stewart, Diana, Pamela, Keith, the Browns, Noel and Bev Hibbard, Becky, uh, Sandy Larson, Dan Gaiman, Evan Vanderbeek, Shirley and James Allen, Clint Smith, Evelyn, the Klingenberg family, Mr. Tucker, uh, Jaquita's cousin, Lydia, uh, Lisa Taylor, Bill Roberts, Taryn, Freddie, Hank, Jerry Woodell, Becky and Kelly, Melba, Judy, Kaylee, Judy Wells, Isaac, Mrs. Holt, Pat, Dennis Hale, Jeannie's daughter and her mother, Bob Eaton, Steve, Kelly, Courtney, and Dennis Hale, and Dennis Watson for wisdom and discernment, and for Jerry Baker's family for cohesion, and for marriage restoration for the Walkers, the Grahams, the Bishops, and that was already restored. Kate and Adam, so that's, I mean, Kat and Adam, that's a praise. And for our upcoming feast, and for the Ungers, and for Esther and Matt's relocation, for Dan Fisher and his helpers, for, in general, we're praying for all the children everywhere, and for our children and their families, for the Klingenberg family, the Morrises, for Maddie and Mr. Baggs, and the Johnsons, the Cindy Walker family, John Lewis and his family, Jan, the Bachelor family, Johnny Skipper family, Don, the Gamels, the Roberts, the Moorheads, the Holmes, Karen Conaway, Calista and her family, Max Rogers family, the Cunninghams, the Dupreys, Shorty, Frank Head, the Chilton family, the K. Bowman family, uh, Joe Wood family, Robert Peoples family, Dan Brewer, Corgans, the Bakers, the Reeds, Ed Haley, the Walkers, Tiffany and her family, Caitlin, Mrs. Jane, Kevin Brock, Donald Blake family, Philip and Angel, Tom Dahl, Melba, the Quitzes, the Middleton family, Currys, Cheryl, the Mounts, Ivan Flannery, Otwell and the Sawyers, Dane Patchen, 
Barbara Szymanski, Daniel Jones family, the Stranges, Dean Morgan, Irene Branch and her family, the Eaton family in general, Milton Morris family, the Maxwells, the Horns, Gloria Busby family, the Littles, the Coleman family, the Baker family, the Vincents, Corey, the Gaymans, the Ungers, Skip's family, Sydney, the Bishops, Kirsten Walker, Gary Bishop and his family, Dr. Peter Bregan, Adam and Evelyn, Joe Martins, Darren, Lane, the Browns, the Crawfords, the Minikies, Emma, Thomas and Elise, Jesse, Andrew and Beth and Lois, Ben and Nathan and Zach and Caleb and Samuel and Patty White and Jeannie Skipper, the Henrys, Brenda Downing's family, Clayton and his family, Boyd's, the Ivies, the Larsons, the Lincolns, the Wardens, the Tollisons, the Rutledges, the Trudeaus, the Townsends, Charlena, Barry and Lana, April Campbell, Linda Hutton, Marilyn Baggs, the Markhams, Jeff Carson, Alex, Mitchell, Gunner, Chad, Gail Smith family, the Hovens, Andrew and his family, Charlene and Wayne, Sandy Sanders, the McWhorters, the Hayeses, the Pattersons, the Pattersons, oh, that's Rachel Patterson and her grandchildren, the Fergusons, Gina, the Muncies, the Blanchards, the Stewards, and Purveyances, and for the Heavenly Father's will about selling or moving or relocating properties. Isaac, Martin, Kincaid's. Did Martin ever sell that property in North Dakota? Not that I know. Vanderbeek's, Butch, and Highway Property, and Mr. Tucker. And he's, I think he's off of there too. And for salvation and repentance, for any and the Skipper and the Hale family, for Heidi, Johnny, Joshua, Glenn and Jerry's family, Katie, Mike Lewis, Becca Eaton, the Segmans, Brenda, Rusty, David and Robin Tipton, Carl Stanley, Kathy Martinez, Kat Fines, Carla, John Ab, Alexa Rouse, Little Luther and Lukey, Ted Hale and his family, Calgary and Abishai, Crystal, the Smiths and Montgomery's, the Funderburks, the Landerno family, the Blakes, the Holmes, Katie, Nick Devine, the Kramers, the Tollisons, Jerry Parson, Mary, Jason, the Henrys, Naomi, Rebecca and Travis, Dwayne, Dan Malone, Deanna and Butch. Deanna and Butch is separate. Isaac McCarthy and his wife, Ben, Classen, Candy and her family, DJ, Ben, Jerry Classen, the Odoms, Macy, Casey, the Walshes, Bill and Brian Key, Donna, the Morrises, the Marleys, Elizabeth and Christian and Allie, Sarinda, Gary Curry, Jamie, Shirley Lancaster, and for Christian like-minded spouses, for our chil children and for other Christians in need of a mate, and for all the prisoners everywhere, especially those that are incarcerated for righteousness sake, and for Matt Hale, John Devine, Chad Bennett, Samuel Biggerstaff, the Texas mother, Walter Chipman, and uh, I think Jeremiah Naylor got out of jail, didn't he? Okay, and the prison ministers and ministries, Heavenly Father direct their paths, and for people to overcome their bad habits and to turn to Christ to overcome their bad habits of tobacco and bad mouths and bad food, bad drink, bad language, etc. And for young couples and expectant moms, Ethan, Blaine and Janae, Ginger, Kristen, the Ogias, Riley and Evan, the Ewarts, Emily, Sarah, Bethany, Ben Burney, Lacey Patchen, and we have James and Ella to add to that one, and a few more others. Here in York. Here in York. Oh, okay. And Adam, uh, Catherine Coleman. And Adam and Catherine Coleman, yeah. And Emily White. And Emily White. And I thought somebody told me to take Aaron York off of the list. No? Well, I got that mixed up. I'm sorry. That's okay. <laughs> All right. We're going to take me off the list. And Erin can go at the end of October when she's had her baby. <laughs> All right. All right. We got that. And for um, the custody issues for Sarah, Serenity, and Piper, for them to be put, hmm? for them to be uh, where the Heavenly Father wants them with the rightful parents, grandparents, or whoever is going to treat them right. And the Matic family, Michaela, the Robinsons, the Perrys, the Hammonds, and the Dickersons, <coughs> for the Church of Israel in, truth, in general and the Israel Truth, for the Prindles, the Kirkpatricks, Patsy and Carolyn, and Barry Martin. And, uh, and Barry Martin is engaged. Okay, we'll so. put him on the young couple's list. All right. Anybody else we need to put on there? <coughs> <coughs>
the right, final good assembly. Idea. And did you add, you also need to add the things that were mentioned. Yeah, I will. Court date for October 2nd. October 2nd. Or Curtis. Curtis. I was thinking Corey, but I know that wasn't right. Is that right? Somebody else to mention. There was one other. Laura Jester. Jester. Laura Jester. Laura. Got it. Okay. Anybody else? We don't want to slide anybody. All right. Daddy, would you open this in word prayer? Heavenly Father, we ask you to hear our prayer today and thank you for being there to hear and praise you for all the people that are on our prayer list and we ask for you to guide and lead and help us all to overcome and just praise you for the peace that you provided for us to come together and meet and worship you and we just pray Heavenly Father you guide us through each day and each service. Now y'all know why I don't read the list. <laughs> I tried it a few times and come to some of the names and Seventy-two.
number one.
number 96.
number 100.
he's writing to his cousin. And uh, he talks about a hedge fence in here. A uh, man came to his house and he, he was getting a scrape and he said, well, I wish there was a hedge fence around about me. That way I would be stopped before I get in trouble and did things I wasn't supposed to do. And the guy said, well, I'll just send you a hedge fence each one a month. And uh, so at the beginning, he reads the hedge and then he tells the story right into his cousin about how it helped him. On the Duke Falls also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him, and delivereth them. Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. Dear Ruth, Father says he believes in hedge fences. He thinks he has good reason to. I'll tell you about it. I carried this one to Mother as soon as it came. That is, it came Saturday night, and I showed it to Mother on Sunday. She and I were having a little talk. I told her there wasn't a thing in this, in this time that could help me, that there was nothing to make a hedge of. But she didn't agree with me. She said she thought they were all, they were all good for hedges, but that last verse was a grand one. Now the last verse was the one that I was most sure couldn't do me any good. I told her I didn't see how that every single one of those verses was about other people. The sort of verses you know that a fellow couldn't twist to make belong to himself, and the last one was miles away. The mother said, Why, Frank, I'm astonished. Haven't you been separated by the one who called them, and hasn't he a peculiar work for you to do? Did I know that mother meant about my coming to Christ, which I did two weeks ago? You know, I told you. But I had never thought about having any work to do, not that he picked out for me. Well, we talked it over, Mother and I. She said she knew he would show me my work when I was ready to do it, and that she hoped I would remember that I was separated from the folks who don't love him and must not go anywhere to soil my clothes. She laughed when I looked puzzled, and she said she was thinking of the time when I was a little fellow and she used to get me ready for church. Tim was here then, and he used to coax me to come out in the garden, and I would shake my hand and say, I can't. I'm all Sunday now, and will sit still. There were more talk that I haven't time to tell you about, but I thought it, of it ever so many times that day. The next afternoon, the Smith boys that were, and that Nickerson fellow that I never had much to do with were out in front of our yard playing marbles. They asked me to come and play, and I went for a few minutes, but Sam Smith had bad luck and had at last began to swear. Pretty soon, Joe Nickerson answered him in the same way. Now, I had hopped and half to hear that kind of talk, and I have always thought that if I kept still, it was the most I could do. But right off there popped into my head that verse about being separated. Said I to myself, I'm not separated much. Now, that's a fact. So long as I stay here and roll marbles, a body who did not know me might think I would swear too whenever I felt like it. I waited a little, but the swearing kept on, and I made up my mind to separate myself. Boy, says I, I'll have to leave. Then they began to coax me not to go, and Sam Smith said he had a nice plan. His mother told him he might bring half a dozen boys home to supper because it was his birthday, and he asked me to be one of them. But I said I would have to go in, and when they got at me for a reason, I thought I ought to tell them, or else it would not be separating myself. So I up and told them that I had made up my mind not to stay anywhere where folks swore. Then they got mad. They called me Parson Hudson, and they said once I had joined the church, I thought I was too good for common folks, and that I ought to be tied to my mother's apron string for fear I should hear somebody say something that wasn't pretty. Then they began to swear again, all three of them, and I ran into the house, and they hooted at me. I told Mother about it. I said I had separated myself as well as I knew how, but I didn't see if there was any chance in it to work. But she told me not to try to go too fast. It wasn't until the next morning that I heard the rest of the story. Don't you believe Sam's mother had not told him he might bring any of the boys to tea? But he did, and he thought she would be sure to give them some supper when they got there. Instead, she sent them all home. Wouldn't I have enjoyed to be one of them? Well, they were mad about it, and they made up their minds to have some fun. So they went to Widow Herbert's garden and tramped down the plants and did lots of mischief, 
and let the pig into the vegetable garden and spoiled everything. There were five of them, and they got found out and taken up, and the widow was willing to settle if the fathers would pay five dollars apiece for each boy. They say that one boy didn't do a thing, only looked on, but his father had to pay all the same. When father told mother and me about it, mother said, Frank, my boy, you see the good result from separating yourself, don't you? And she told father all about it, and he said that a hedge fence that saved him $5 in one night was worth thinking about. But I told mother that, after all, I didn't see any work for me to do, and she said, wait, that I hadn't heard the end of the story yet. Perhaps that was that there was no telling what I might do sometime for those very boys because they would keep watch of me now to see if I was to be trusted in other things. Then after a minute she said softly, you don't know how large a work you may have begun in interesting your father in your hedge fence. I thought about that a good deal and I made up my mind I would ask you to help me pray for father. He is real splendid good, you know, only he isn't a Christian, and Mother and I want him to be dreadfully your cousin, Frank Hudson. And I don't know why people think that going and getting in trouble or messing other people's things up is fun, because all it does is make you a bad person and have a thorn in your conscience. to be here and, and I enjoy the young people. I bet you didn't go a day to public school, did you? Yeah. She knows how to read. <laughs> Very interesting. I remember the first time we met James. See, I was here in 19, what was when I was there? 1984, 1980. 88, somewhere in there. And uh, I don't know if James was around at that time. If he was, I didn't see him, so I don't know. <laughs> but when he walked in our Bible study up there, we thought he was a lone ranger from Texas. <laughs> had his white cowboy hat on and white shoes, boots, and I don't know what all, but all of the women were white stricken by him. <laughs> You're a lucky girl. Had lots of competition over here. So, but I'm impressed with all of the, your children and the ones they have brought into their lives. I, I'm impressed with them too. You know, last night I told a little story about when they preached on the second coming of Christ, and I had another one I wanted to share with you. There was a young preacher, and of course, years ago, he used to go to Bible college and seminary. And uh, he had just gotten out of seminary. Now I call it the cemetery, but it's seminary. And he was preaching, but he had a problem. He would read his Bible. He would read a verse like in Revelation chapter 22, 12. Behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me to give to every man according to his works. And then he would close his Bible and then he would start to quote the Bible verse. He'd say, I, I come quickly and then he'd forget it. And he was embarrassed, and he'd have to look it up. And so he went to see one of his old professors, and his professor said, well, he said, that's a psychosomatic thing. He said, you need to exercise your body. You need to move your body. And so he, so he made a practice. He'd read it, he'd read a verse, and then he'd back up, and he'd step over it, he'd start to quote it. And he, it helped. But he was preaching on the second coming of Christ from this passage, and he read it, and he got over and he says, Behold, I come quickly, and he forgot it. He backed up and he says, Behold, I come quickly, and he forgot it. And he backed up and said, Behold, I come quickly, and he forgot it. And the next time he started coming, he tripped and fell right out in the lady <laughs> on the your danger place. And uh, right in her lap, and he was so embarrassed, he got up and he was apologizing. And she was an elderly lady, and she said, Young man, don't apologize. It's not your fault. You told me four times you were coming. And I <laughs> well, <laughs> nice to see the Christophers get up as 
morning drive over. It's good to see you walking and getting around good. That's good. Did you get those books I sent you? Good. Go on some more. Let me know. You know, David was anointed king when he was a young man. And he had nobody to be king over. In fact, Saul was king. And so when the day came that he was going to be king over the tribe of Judah, the tribe of Judah said, David, we know you're supposed to be the king, and we need a king, and we want you to be our king. And he called for the prophets, and he was anointed again. And later on, he was invited by the rest of Israel to be their king, and he was anointed the third time. So when you look at that passage and you look at what happened to him, you realize that as you go about your work in the Lord, one anointing is not enough. You need a fresh anointing for more activity. So I want to say this this morning, last night's anointing is not for, enough for today. So I'm going to ask God to give me another anointing, okay? Father, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for all that's in your word, the promises that you've given us. Last night we talked about the promise of the power to bind evil and to cast it out and to call for the shield of God that protects us. We live in a dangerous time. We live in a time when we need to have the promises of God to the power that we can bind up sickness and we can bind up evil and we can have the shield of God that protects us from those that would destroy us. And yet I need a new anointing this morning, Lord. I ask you to anoint my heart and my mind and my tongue and help me to say that which needs to be said and to not say that which needs not to be said. And then on top of that, Lord, we need an anointing of ears and minds that hear. I pray, Lord, that you will allow each person to hear what they need to hear from this passage and this me message that I give today. There is no way in the world that everything I say is going to be for everybody. So I pray, Lord, that you give them wisdom. And when they hear what is for them, they will recognize it and they will be able to take it to their heart. And we'll give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to read this morning from the book of Isaiah, chapter 22, and verses 20 through 25. Isaiah chapter 22 and starting in verse 20. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will care call my servant Eliakim the son of Hilkah. And I will clothe him with thy robe and strengthen him with thy girdle. And I will commit thy government into his hand. And he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. And the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder. So he shall open, and none shall shut. And he shall shut, and none shall open. And I will fasten him as a nail. This is my key passage. I will fasten him as a nail in a secure place. And he shall be for a glorious throne to his father's house. And they shall hang upon him all the glory of his father's house, the offspring and the issue all vessels of small quantity from the vessels of cups even to all the vessels of flagons that means big ones in that day saith the lord of hosts shall the nail that fast that is, that is fastened in the secure place be removed and be cut down and fall and the burden that was upon it shall be cut off for the lord has spoken it there used to be a church a big church that was doing many mighty works for God. But the pastor committed adultery, and he fell, and his family fell, and the church fell. There was a family that was wonderful. It was a place where the children were happy, and the husband and the wife were doing that which was right, and they had happiness. And the husband and the dad did not do his job spiritually, and the family fell apart. There was another family that I knew, happy and prosperous, but the wife was unfaithful and independent and demanding and self-serving. And she had the, the heartbreak of losing her children and her husband, and they fell apart. The same is true of the nation of Israel as well as the nation of America 
and the nation of England and, and uh, uh, all of uh, Great Britain and all of the European nations that are Israelite people, that they used to be a great people, a great nation, a great and powerful team upon the world, and yet the leaders have been made into evil people and they have committed adultery and fornication and they have gone after false gods and their nations are now falling and crumbling. This passage that we read was prophet Isaiah telling the current ruler, the current nail that was in place that God had put in a firm place that he has sinned and now he has fallen and his burden has fallen. The Isaiah tells the leaders and the people that in that day the Savior would come, my Savior, uh, my servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkah. Those words are significant because the word Eliakim signifies the resurrected Lord, my God. He shall arise. And the word Hilkah signifies the Lord, my portion, or my lot, my choice. Thus concealed in these names are the prophecy by Isaiah alluding to Jesus Christ who would be the new nail that would come and be nailed in to the wall and all of Israel would hang upon him. But I want to take an application of this message this morning and I want us to look at the subject about the nail. You want people to see Jesus, then you have to be a nail in a secure place. The Bible says there are things that hang on a nail. Everybody in here is a little bit of construction. I know that uh, Brother Marvin is, and I know that I've done a little bit. I know that uh, J.T. Hale's done some. And we all know what it's like to drive a nail in a wall. And depends on what you drive it in, if it's going to hold. When the nail falls, those things on the nail fall. Have you ever been sleeping at night and you hear something go and you get up and there's a nail that you had put up a shelf or something and the whole thing fell and everything that was on it fell and it woke you up? There was another church that I knew had a pastor who got bitter and left the ministry and the church fell apart. There was another mother and a father. I knew several families that fell apart. I knew Sunday school teachers that did great work for God for a while. And then they drifted away from God. And their class fell and they fell. There was a deacon that I had. One, I only had one, thank God. I had one deacon that served well for a while. And then he got into sin. And he lost his, his message. He lost his witness. He lost his power. These were nails not fastened in a secure place. Every person in this room is a nail. Every Christian is a nail. Every child of God is a nail. Then somebody is hanging on you. Somebody is hanging on you. If you fall, those who are hung on you will fall. It may be a pastor. It may be a mama. It may be a daddy. Every person in this room is a nail, and if you're not fastened in a secure place and you fall, the things that are on you fall. Abraham was a nail. He fell and went to Egypt, I believe. And Lot fell. His daughters fell. His wife died. His two nations of ungodly people were born, and we still suffer from the falling of that nail in the world today because of that. When Abimelech and Naomi went over into Moab, his sons fell. Dad, you're a nail. God says that nails are to be fastened in a secure place. Mom, you're a nail. You musicians, you're a nail. You that sing, you're a nail. You don't realize how much uh, power and authority and, and influence you have. Let me give you a, an example. Many of you have heard a little bit about my history and where I came from. I was born in Oklahoma. I was born, uh, how many of you know where Waldron, Arkansas is? Uh, you know where Waldron is? And then out, of, out toward the Oklahoma line, there's a town called Han. Any of you know where Han is? Han, Arkansas? That's where my, uh, and around Poto Mountain. That's where my granddaddy raised 13 kids, mostly girls, 
on a 40-acre farm, and they didn't work on Sunday, and they paid all the bills. He was a deacon in what they call the Hard Shell Baptist Church. You know what a Hard Shell Baptist Church is? They're, they're, they believe in the sovereignty of God, which I do too. And I remember him telling me as a young, younger person, and I asked him about missions, and he said, well, we don't support missions. We believe God knows where all his people are. He knows how to get them in when he wants them, and he don't need our help. I thought, well, that was kind of strange. But you know, today I kind of feel the same way he does. <laughs> and anyway, my mother, she had married a guy who was a barber. And uh, he was out hunting. And he leaned his gun up against the fence, climbed over the fence, and went off and killed him. And she was only 25 years old, and he was 26. In the same community, there was another man by the name of Everett Leon Ramsey, who had married a woman, and he had eight children. And they were all grown. His wife had died, and he was a Baptist preacher. And he and my 26-year-old mother-to-be got together and got married. And she became the black sheep of the family. And the family basically rejected her for some reason. To this day, I don't know why. I think because of the age difference or disparage. And I remember that <clears throat> we moved over into Oklahoma. At least that was the... I don't remember it as an experience, but I remember from hearing about it. I was born in Oklahoma, and I, I was working on my um, uh, birth certificate. And so I drove from Missouri to Oklahoma City, went to the Hall of Records, and got a copy of my birth certificate. I wanted to know all about my, my family. And it says I was born in Pine Valley. Now, I've never been able to find anything anywhere about Pine Valley. But it was close to a little place called Muse, M-U-S-E. Does anybody know where that is? That's not too far from, uh, uh, what's the town, Muskogee? No, it's right up there. Oh, right up here. Yeah. Oh, well, that's good to know. I've, I always thought it was close. I never could find it. It's up here. I was, it, it was very obvious. From the birth certificate, I was home born. I was home birthed, so I tell everybody I was hatched on a stump out in the woods somewhere. <laughs> but I remember <clears throat> that my mother would tell her folks, as she had me as the oldest child and my brother, a year about 13 months later, and we were living in Oklahoma, and they were having hard times. It was in the in the at the end of the Depression. I was born in 1939. He was born in 1940. And we got on a train and we went to California. Why? Because my mother had another sister who was married to a man who had huge orchards in the San Joaquin Valley. And they said, we got an extra house. Come on out and live here and we'll help you. And I remember that I was just a, a little kid. I was maybe, maybe I was four years old as I stood and looked out the train window as we went along. And I remember in California that my dad got up in a place kind of like this, and he was preaching. And it was my birthday, and he called me up, and he sang happy birthday and all that. And I remember sitting down in that place, and as I looked up, it in my heart, I said, that's what I want to do. I want to preach. And so when I was brought to Missouri, my mother died when she was 32 years old. And my father was 67 years old. That's how much difference there was in their age. And he couldn't take care of two little babies. He was going to put us in an orphanage. And our mother's sister in Missouri was married to a fellow who had 6,000 acres and 400 head of cattle and no children. He said, we'll adopt those two boys. Found out many years later that he was a Canaanite. She had lost her womb because of she made some bad decisions. And she married him, and she couldn't have children, so they adopted us. And I remember as she would take us to Sunday school, he would stand out on the road and curse at us. He hated Christians. I've got a letter he wrote to Rockefeller. 
and he said, Mr. Rockefeller will never be successful with world government until we get rid of the Christians. Well, he's right about that. But I remember sitting in the Raymondville Baptist Church, and the preachers would preach. And they were, the Spirit was saying to me, I want to preach. I want to preach. But you know, we, we adults, we do dumb things sometimes. Every time they would bring a man in to give his testimony, he'd get up and say, I was an alcoholic, and I used drugs, and I left my wife. I used to beat my wife. And, and, and God came down and reached down and got me and saved me. And then he wanted me to preach, and I said, no, God, I don't want to preach. I don't want to preach. And he kept after me. One guy even says he even had one arm on. And he said, I lost it because when I got saved, I didn't want to preach. And I went out and got drunk, and I fell down on the railroad track, and the train cut my, my, my arm off. And I knew that God was going to kill me if I didn't preach. So. And so I grew up believing that if you want to preach, that's flesh. you got to not want to preach, and God make you preach. Well, that wasn't the way it was with me. I wanted to preach. And I thought, well, God doesn't give his people a want to. But you know, they were wrong. They were wrong about it. How many of you have ever heard of John R. Rice? Ever heard of John R. Rice? He was an old Baptist evangelist, and he said, they, he was that way. He said, I wanted to preach, and they kept telling me, no, 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 you got to not want to preach. You got, God's got to make you want to preach. And he said, one night I was speaking at a, in a place, and it was a, a, the, a mission in Chicago, and Old Rump came down and I told him how to come to Jesus and he said, it, just, it was just so right. He said, I just got down on my knees at that altar and I said, God, I'm going to preach. If you don't want me to preach, kill me. <laughs> and he said, I've been preaching now for 60 years. Wow. So it's not that God has to make you want. In fact, I wonder sometimes about people who have to be hit over the head to do what God wants them to do. I, I wonder about that. <laughs> but to be a nail in a, in a firm place and place, and by the way, when you when you're a singer and you get up on a or a musician or a preacher, there are young people that look at you, and the Spirit of God can give them that desire to work for Him, if you are in the right place a long time and uh, so forth. And so, it is important that we are in the right place. The drywall is not a firm place. We got to be in a firm place. Ever drive a nail in wall? Uh, and, and sheet rock to hang a, a, a curtain rod. I hate to do that. I almost always, if anymore, I'll say it to my wife, I'll say, I gotta go get a piece of wood and put up here. I can't. And uh, she's, she's better at that than I am sometimes. But anyway, drywall is not the place. Every, every time you get into drywall, it's salt. The success of the nail, the, the success of the nail depends on where you put it. It's got to be in a firm place. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. I dare not trust the sweetest strain, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. That's the rock. That's the solid place. That's the place where you want to put your nail. You want to be driven into this book. Into this book is solid ground, not the sinking sand. You're in a, if you're in the worldly mush of she rock, dry and soft, you need to get out of it. Drive your nail in the Bible. Drive your nail in a Bible-believing place of worship. Drive your nail in a place where the people preach from the Word of God. You know, we all, we all grow up with preconceived ideas sometimes. The first uh, woman God allowed me to marry, and we had a great marriage. She was 56 years. We were married, and she died. But she came out of the assemblies of God. Now, she wasn't. She went there as a young girl, and she found the Lord there. But she hadn't been totally indoctrinated in some of the things that they did. But she was a good woman. But I grew up in a Baptist church where and, and a, a Baptist among Baptist preachers who didn't have real good, favorable feelings about Catholic priests and Presbyterian preachers and, and that kind of thing, you know. Um, so whenever I met my wife, she said she was a Missouri Senate Lutheran. 
And I, I said, well, Lord, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll go meet her. But I said, you know, I don't have, I don't have a very good feeling about that. Well, when I met her, I'd only been with her for less than 30 minutes. And there, there, you know, I've never seen a vision. I've never had a vision where God came and spoke to me. I've never heard God visibly or vocally. But there have been two or three times in my life when God has made an impression on me that I knew it was God. One time was when I was in jail, I was a Christian school, and I kept saying, why are we having so much trouble getting out? The, the attorneys had spent hundreds and thousands of dollars and gone to many, many courts, and they had gone, and I couldn't get out. And one night, I was up in the middle of the night praying, and it was almost, almost like I heard the Lord said, when you're out, you're not working. When you're here, it's working. And I said, oh, okay. I'll just be, he, said, he said, be quiet and just wait. Things will happen. My timing, my way. And they did. But it was kind of like that when I met her. We met online. Her husband had died. She didn't really want to see me. I mean, the first time I, I contacted her, she, you know, I live in a little town called Houston, 2,200 people. When I was in high school, I had 2,200 people. That was 40 years ago or longer, and it's still got 2,200. It's still got the same number. And as it grown, hasn't, hasn't done anything different. But the one thing about a small town is everybody knows everything about everybody. And if you put on, if you go on to a dating site and you say on there, you're from Houston, Missouri, everybody in town is going to know about it. So I didn't want that. So I said, well, I was from Springfield. And so when I contacted my wife, she looked at that, and she's in St. Louis. She said, wow, that's too far away. I, I, I don't want a long, I don't want a long uh, distant uh, uh, relationship. And I said, I don't either. But I said, until it becomes a close relationship, I'm willing to pay the bills, do all the driving, do all the buying the gas, take all the risks. So I said, what do you got to lose? I found out later she went back to her girlfriends and they said, yeah, what do you got to lose? You're going to get a free meal out of it, you know, you might as well go. <laughs> I drove to St. Louis, we met at Denny's. And uh, you'll have to ask her about that story. That's something else. She, she tells us. She, see, I didn't realize what, I just was me. I was just me. That's all I was. And I had, I had in my hand, I had a notepad and some things. And she knew I was a preacher. So I think I had a Bible and I had her profile and I had a notebook and a pen. And I was, you know, it was almost like an interview. I didn't realize it. <laughs> so she, she got a real kick out of that. You know? And, uh, but when you lose your spouse, something happens in you. Not just to a, a woman, but to a man. Just think about this. When God created Adam, the Bible says he created in, in chapter 1, verse 26, he says he created Adam male and female. Now, I think I've had two confirmations on what I believe about that, so I'm happy with what I believe, but most people don't believe what I believe about that. I believe that when he created Adam in chapter 26, he created him like an earthworm, male and female. In chapter 2, a dilemma came up. You read it. It says, and he passed all the creatures by Adam, and he named them. What's the last part of that sentence? And Adam did not find a helpmate among them. Hey, Adam, here's an elephant. Think you're looking, no, I don't want to sleep with no elephant. Well, here's a rhinoceros. No, I don't want that. 
and I believe, I'm sorry, well, I won't say it. I know this is going on YouTube, but I, it included other two-legged animals. And he said, no. And God said, this man cannot live by himself. He can, he's got to have help. You don't realize how helpless we are. I mean, when, <laughs> my, when we got married, my wife came down and she said, well, how, how did you cook? What did you? She opened up the refrigerator and there's this big pan of oatmeal. <laughs> In the morning, I have oatmeal. <laughs> At noon, I have oatmeal. <laughs> At night, I have another slice of oatmeal. <laughs> when I run out, I throw on a big pot and make more oatmeal. Or I take a, a skillet and fry an egg and put the skillet down here, get it out at night, fry an egg, put it back under. I maybe watch the skillet once a week. Wonder I didn't die from gangrene or something, you know. A man doesn't do well by himself. He needs a helpmate. And God reached inside Adam. And the Bible says it took a rib, but that is, that is a, a symbol that is not, he didn't just go in and pull out a rib. He reached in and he took a little bit of Adam's spirit, a little bit of his soul, and a little bit of his body. And he made a woman. That's where the term goes, I want to find my soul mate. And when that happens, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. I love my wife. My first wife was a wonderful woman. But I'll tell you what, the one I have right now is what I need right now. That's what I need. Make sure your nail is driven in a firm place. A place, the right place. Not only a firm place, but the right place. At the time that Isaiah was speaking, the leader and the ruler of Jerusalem was Shibna. He was a treasure. And the Bible says that he was a nail, but he came loose and he fell. And his father's house fell, his name fell, his honor fell, his reputation fell. That's why when you children, when you children do something that's evil or bad, you make your parents look bad. I remember, and some people don't agree with me on this, but I remember when my children were growing up, when they got to be about 10 or 11 years old, I began to talk to them. And I'd say, I'm a preacher. God called me to preach. And the Bible says that I can preach as long as my children are under subjection. they obedient. I said, the day when you become a drunkard, the day when you become a harlot, or you become a prostitute, or you go out and commit adultery, or you have children out of wedlock, the day you do that, that's the day my ministry is done. And it's your fault because I've taught you better. Thank God my children never did do that. But I know some preachers whose kids cost them <coughs> their ministry. And that's because they didn't raise their children, correct? When you fall, your family is affected. When Shebna's offspring fell, his father's house fell, his house fell, and his children fell. Three generations of people fell when he fell. Our sins will fall according to the, the, the word of God to the third and the fourth generation. The single most factor in the fall of young people today is the unfaithfulness and the wickedness of the parents. I remember when I was in Webster University in St. Louis, I was taking a I was taking a writing course. It was supposed to be a technical writing course, but it wasn't. It was a it was how to write uh, fiction. Well, I never did like fiction. I don't read much fiction. I read thousands of books, but I don't read much fiction. In fact, I think if you dwell too much on fiction, your life becomes fictionous, and I don't think that's good. 
But I had seen a movie that I, a little movie clip in a church that I liked real well, and I wanted to write that as a story so I could get a grade on it. And what it was, it, 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 told, it showed this family with their children, and the girl was going, to, was going to graduate from high school. And the night that they had the graduation, she and her boyfriend went out and they got drunk, and they ran in front of a train and they got killed, and, 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 and that was the story. But the moral of the story came when the mother, the mother and the father said, we want to know who sold these miners the beer and the, and the whiskey that got them drunk. And to shorten the story, to make it come around, the daddy went into his cabinet where he kept his whiskey to get a drink for his, to soothe his mind. And there was a note from his daughter who said, I hope you don't mind, Daddy, we took yours. And that's what killed him. And I wrote that story, and I got an F. Because the wicked universities don't want truth. They want fiction. And even though it was a fiction story, it had truth. What we need is we need people who are a nail in a firm place, in a right place, in a secure place. You know, <clears throat> back yonder, God had a job to do, and he created you. He created you for part of that job. And that means that you are something in his eyes. And that means that you're somebody with God, and you don't have the right to take your life and say, I want, to become a, I want to become a movie star. I want to become a... I've always taught my children and my churches that if, if you're my young people and you go to my church and you become a, a star for the St. Louis Cardinals, I'm not going to go see you play. I'm not going to be that proud of you. I'd rather you become a preacher or a good husband or become a good, uh, a good dad. I'd rather you become something for the kingdom of God than to go out and try to entertain the world. Somebody says, and a lot of people sometimes will come to me and say, well, I'm going to move. Well, why are you going to move? I, 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 it's too cold here. I want to go where it's warm. Buy you some long handles. <laughs> Stay where God puts you until God moves you. You're not your own. You're bought with a price. Shipping it fell and his family fell. Not only in a secure place, not only in the right place, but in the same place. What happens when you pull a nail out of a secure place? Well, the first thing you do is bend the nail. And if you get you pull yourself out of where God puts you, you'll bend your life. You'll bend your life. And it'll be bent, probably, the rest of your life. So make sure that God's in the mood when you change. It leaves a scar. A second nail will never be as secure in that spot. Your life will forever be bent, and forever you'll leave a scar. I preached this message at the conference this week, and afterwards there was a young man, about like this young man right here. In fact, when he walked in, I thought it was the same young man I'd, I'd seen, but it, I realized it wasn't. But he came up to me, and he said, to, he was very polite, and he says, uh, uh, Pastor, do you have time? Could I tell you a story? And I said, yeah, I'd love to hear it. And he says, you know, in school, my teacher told us a story. She said there was a father who had a boy that he couldn't control. And the boy kept getting in trouble. And he told his son, he said, I want you to go get me some nails and get me a board and a hammer. And he brought it in and he said, now, son, every time you disobey me and every time you do something you shouldn't, I'm going to drive a nail in this board. And every time you do something that's great, every time you obey me, and every time you do something wonderful, I'm going to pull a nail out. And eventually the day came as he grew up that he got better and better, and eventually the board was empty, didn't have any nails. And his son looked at it and said, yeah, but it's still got holes in it. It's still got holes where the nails were. 
And his dad said, son, when you sin, you always leave a scar. You always leave a scar. We can get the nail out, of it, but we can't take the scar. You know why, you know why most, and, and I'm going to get in trouble by the I see this. You know why most retired people don't make good church members? Because they don't want to make a commitment anymore to be faithful and to tithe and to be a part of the program. But I've got people in my work now, just like this man right here that's faithful, he goes beyond. He goes way beyond. He comes to Mountain Home every service and films it. He comes to my house to every service and films it. I said, do you want to go to Tulsa to film? He said, yeah, I want to go there. I said, do you want to go to Smithfield? Yeah, I want to go there too. I couldn't believe it. His wife actually let him come too. She <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so we've had a great time. He's helped us drive. My wife's not able to drive like she should. And I'm getting too old to drive. I know that. I'm not as, fa as good as I used to be. And I, my wife is about 10 years younger than me, and she drives most of the time, so we let uh, him drive. But, <clears throat> you know, uh, the retired people, I've got some people that you can't depend on them. Oh, i gotta go, I got to go to the Bluegrass Festival, or I've got to go to this place or that place, or I've got to go be here and be there. You can't build a work for God on that kind of people. You've got to have people who will say, well, we we'll, you can count on us. We may not have much. We may not have a lot of money. We may not have a lot of things we can give and do, but we'll be there. We'll do it. We'll do what we can. Husbands and wives that stay together give security. People who are faithful give security. That's why I don't like to be gone from my pulpit on Sunday. If I'm, gonna, if I'm supposed to be in, in Houston Sunday, I want to be there. If I'm supposed to be in Mountain Home Sunday, I want to be there. If I'm supposed to be in uh, Wisconsin the last week in October, then I want to be there. That's where I want to be. I'm, I told you I was going to be here. That's why I want to be here. I want to be dependable because that brings a security to the people. My parents did not get divorced. I just told you they died. And I was adopted. Then it was a traumatic experience. So be careful about divorce. It can have a traumatic, it can have a traumatic experience. Successful businesses have been a lot around for a long time. Successful ministries. This ministry right here been here. How long have you been here, JT? 100 years? <laughs> Almost. Almost 100 years. Been here for a long time. Everywhere I go, I hear people talk about JT Hale. They, know, they still know you. People in the second, third generation know you. And they know what you do. Not only <clears throat> great pastors have been there a long time. Great teachers have been there. Great marriages last a long time. Wall hoppers and nail jumpers never get the job done. A secure place, the right place, the same place, and in place. You'll never be in the right place or in a secure place unless you are in place. Some nails are barely driven in the wall. You have a shaking and they fall out. You know, uh, we don't really get any earthquakes, but once in a great while, do you get earthquakes down here? Once in a while, you ever get a shaking down here? Once in a while? I know they do in northern in Arkansas, northern Arkansas. They had one here about a week ago. We don't get much. But once in a while, it may be an airplane it, it hit the sonic boom, or it may be the earthquake, but it'll shake a little bit, and boy, everything is loose. <laughs> comes out. And that's the way the church is, is those people who are barely stuck in there when trouble comes and stress comes and problems come, they fall by the way. They're not there. When I go out and I talk to people about the Lord, I still do that. I don't do it like I did when I was in the, in the Independent Baptist Movement, but I, I still go see people. And I have people tell me, well, I used to go to church. I used to be a teacher. I used to be a pastor or an elder. I used to was. Well, we got too many well, uh, used to wasers, has beeners, and going to beers. We need some am uh, I amers. One of the problems is these nails are barely in. They fall out of the church. They fall out of the family. They fall out of work. And everything that hangs on them falls too. Be a nail fastened in a secure place. Get out of the world. Be a nail fastened in the right place. And be in place. What is it you need to do to your life to make it to be a place where you are a nail in a secure place. Only you know that. I don't. 
But I would ask you this morning to look at your life and say, am I barely in or am I solidly in? That's what we need. Father, help us to be a nail in a secure place. We think about this king that you had to replace. Yes, you replaced him with Jesus Christ. And we knew that that was the greatest nail we could have. But Lord, help us to be a nail in the right place and help us to be in a firm place. Help us to be in place. Help the people who hang on us to not be disappointed and help us not to cause them to fall. And we'll give you the praise for all the glory and wonderful things you do in Israel. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.